Afternoon guys, Dave Canterbury at the Pathfinder School. What I thought we'd do today is continue with our basic series of survival knowledge a little bit and talk a little bit about groundwater sources and utilizing and collecting groundwater sources. Stay with me and we'll get started. Okay, I chose an area today that is running water out here at the Pathfinder School. It has rained continuously for about the last 12 hours. So the water is muddied up, it's not clear. You may be in that situation where you've got to collect that type of water. So you need to understand that. Just because the water's not completely clear doesn't necessarily mean that it's contaminated. And one thing that I want you to understand right off the bat is a lot of the things that I see and hear people talk about purifying their water. You're not going to purify water in a wilderness environment. It takes expensive processes like reverse osmosis and other things to purify water. What you're going to do is decontaminate your water the best you can. Now the CDC and the Wilderness Medical Society both agree that the most foolproof method to 100% disinfect your water of at least waterborne pathogens is to filter and then boil. And the boil part is important because a lot of people don't understand the contact time, it's called, of the boil. And everything that you do with water to decontaminate it or disinfect it has to do with contact time. How much time does it have to remain in this state or with this chemical treatment in it to be considered safe or safer for human consumption? And with boiling water, if you are at normal altitude of less than about 5,000 feet, as soon as that water reaches a rolling boil, it's good. Anything after that is just wasting your resource through evaporation. If you're above that 5,000 feet, your water will boil at a lower temperature than it does at normal elevation. That's where the contact time comes in. The temperature, the temperature that you're looking for, I guess I'm bleeding a little bit, I didn't notice it. The temperature that you're looking for to begin to kill waterborne pathogens, and we're talking about Giardia and Cryptosporidium here, things like that. We're not talking about third world countries where we have to worry about cholera. We're not talking about chemical, to, chemical contaminants. We're talking about waterborne pathogens like Giardia and Cryptosporidium that are very common in the U.S. in mountainous areas, in wilderness areas, and even in the eastern woodlands. Giardia better known as beaver fever. So 165 degrees or thereabouts is the pasteurization temperature that it takes to start to kill off those waterborne pathogens. And the time it takes for that water, the contact time of heat from 165 degrees to the boiling point of 212 is enough contact time to kill off 100% of those waterborne pathogens. So if your water boils at a higher altitude at a lower temperature, then you haven't had enough contact time. So you need to boil that water for a little while longer and they say about two minutes at a rolling boil. At normal elevation, once it hits rolling boil, that's good enough. So that's the first thing we need to understand. The second thing we need to understand is that there's a lot of ways that you can disinfect your water that are not going to be 100% foolproof against waterborne pathogens. And that's what we're talking about mainly, waterborne pathogens. If I'm worried about chemical runoff and things like that, then I'm probably pretty close to civilization. If I'm in the middle of nowhere, I should mainly be worried about the waterborne type pathogens. So understanding that, boiling is going to be 100% effective. Filter, boil is going to be your best bet. If you cannot boil your water for some reason, then you can use other methods to disinfect your water as well, like iodine, 2% tincture of iodine, or chlorine dioxide. Those two things are the most commonly used. Iodine can be a problem with women or people that have, women that are pregnant or people who have thyroid issues. Chlorine dioxide um, is better, but the cysts of cryptosporidium are very, very resistant to chlorine dioxide. Both of those things have what's called contact time. In other words, how long that chemical has to be in the water before that water is considered drinkable. And it varies depending on the chemical. And I would suggest that you look that up and look up the dosage amounts, but everything will be measured in one U.S. quart or liter. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about in this video in just a minute. Okay, so the first thing that we want to discuss when we're talking about collecting a groundwater source is where are we going to collect it from? Now, sometimes we're not going to have a choice. It's the only water we can find. It doesn't really matter what it looks like. we got to take what we can get. If I've got a choice and I've got a long stream bed or I've got multiple sources of water that I can choose and pick from, then I'm going to be a little more particular, not because I can tell by looking at the water whether it's good, clean water or not, 
but I have a better chance of the water having less contamination by looking at certain factors. Is there fish living in the water? Are there frogs living around the water? Are there tracks where wildlife's been drinking the water? Are there plants growing in the water? All of those things indicate that the water is fairly clean because contaminated water or really skanky water is not going to grow anything but mosquitoes. So I want to really look at the water that I'm collecting if I have that choice. Now in this case, you know, I'd like to see the water be clear. I'd like to see it running and I'd like to see it clear. I'd like to be running over some type of media like sand or small gravel or a clay base, something that's going to help with the filtration process, maybe lots of plants and weeds in the water that is filtering through as well. But if it just rained, you really don't know because the water is going to be clouded just like it is today. So what you have to do is you have to take that at face value and understand what you're going to do in your mind to disinfect your water. And I can tell you what the best practices are, but what you do is up to you. And what I do, my own personal preference, could be totally different. But what I'm going to talk to you today about is best practices. Okay, so as we talked about before, you know, the Center for Disease Control says the best way to clean your water for human consumption, to disinfect your water, is to filter and then boil. Well, what do they mean by filter the water? Are they talking about sticking your t-shirt or bandana over your water bottle and submerging it in the water? No, that's not what they're talking about. They really mean through some type of a charcoal or ceramic type filter, a filtration process. And we may or may not be able to duplicate that, but we can always duplicate the boil portion of it which will kill 100% of things like Giardia and Cryptosporidium. So we want to make sure that if we can boil, that's our first choice, always, because that's the only way that we're going to kill 100% of those waterborne pathogens. Again, we're not talking about chemical contaminants. We're talking about Giardia and Cryptosporidium for the most part, because that's going to be the most common in the eastern woodlands. So now that we've talked about that, let's talk about our kit and what we carry in our kit for water disinfection before we collect water. Okay, so on the side of my pack here, I have just a standard Condor water bottle holder. You can buy these anywhere on the internet. You can buy them on our website. And the thing I like about this is it holds the water, stainless steel water bottle cup and things like that very nicely. It has a pouch in the front of it that you can put other things in. And what I put in there are the things that I'm going to use for my water. So generally what I'll carry is, I'll carry some type of a filter. And this one happens to be a Aquamira Frontier Pro. And this is a 50 gallon filter. Now you can use anything like a life straw would work just fine as well. But some type of a straw type filter is always good to carry because in an emergency where you can't boil, you really need to just drink the water directly from the source. Maybe you got yourself too dehydrated, whatever the case may be, but you need to drink directly from a source. This is the ticket. You can shove this hose right into the water. You can drink right through this bite valve. Are you taking a chance at that rate? You sure are. But you're taking a chance with anything other than boil. So with that said, I carry that with me. Now the other two things that I carry, and we'll forget about this being a disinfection method because this is just filtering the water directly from the source and drinking it. The two things that I generally carry, remember that everything is, you know, if I carry three ways to start fire, I'm going to carry three ways to take care of my water. The first one is always going to be fire. The second one is Aquamira water purification tablets. They call them purifiers, but like I said, you're not going to purify your water without some type of a heavy-duty process like reverse osmosis. So these are disinfection tablets. They're chlorine dioxide. There are like 24 tablets in this packet. One tablet will disinfect one U.S. quarter liter of water. So you've got six gallons right there of water that you could disinfect potentially if you had to and couldn't start fire. 2% tincture of iodine is my third choice. So I've got boil, chlorine dioxide, iodine. Now, from a conservation of resources standpoint, number one, because it's 100% effective, I'm always going to choose boil first. If I can't boil, my second option is always going to be the chlorine dioxide because even though they're very close in similarity as far as the percentage of things that they kill, the iodine is medicinal. So I want to save that resource for the last. So I'm going to use up the chlorine dioxide tabs first, and the 2% tincture of iodine is my last resort because it's part of my first aid kit as well. But those would be my three methods of choice, and then I would put some type of filter in there as well in case I had to drink straight from the source. Now, let's talk real quick about water bottles for a minute. 
And this brings us to the conversation of, you know, why I say always carry a metal container. I've always said that any container that you carry, or at least your main container, should definitely be metal so that you can put it in the fire. And that is so that you can, A, disinfect your water. B, make char cloth. C, make medicine. D, make food. But, the type of water bottle that you carry is very important. Now, this is the Pathfinder 32 ounce water bottle. This water bottle is exactly 32 ounces to the top. There's no other water bottle on the market that's made out of stainless steel, one piece design, that's 32 ounces to the top. And there's a reason I designed this bottle this way. Every chemical decontaminant that you put in your water, it's always measured in one U.S. quart or liter. X amount for X amount of contact time for one U.S. quart or liter. And the contact time varies, and I would encourage you to look that up. It's one tablet for chlorine dioxide for things like bleach or 2% tincture of iodine. It's X amount of drops, if you can figure out what a drop is, per U.S. quarter liter. That's the other reason I like the tablets. They're really easy. One tablet, one U.S. quarter liter. But if this bottle is less than one U.S. quarter liter, how do I know I'm not using too much or too little? Am I wasting a resource or am I not killing everything in the water that I could possibly kill? If this thing is over 32 ounces, like a 40 ounce bottle, the same applies. I have to use more. Did I use enough? What's the difference between 32 and 40? How much more chlorine dioxide do I need to put in there? How much more iodine do I need to put in there? How much more bleach do I need to put in there? Those are questions I don't want to have to mess with in a scenario where I might not be thinking as clearly as I possibly could. I want 32 ounces and nothing else because that's the way all of the stuff is measured out. So I don't understand why nobody's ever created a 32 ounce bottle. Even, you know, the old bottle, the old guy design bottles that were one of my favorites before they went off the market, one of them was 34 and the other one was like 38. They weren't 32. So when those bottles went away and we decided to create our own water bottle so that we could capture that market that the guy design bottle used to have, we decided to go with exactly 32 ounces for that reason. All right, if I can find a place like this where the water is running over something, I'm going to be careful not to step directly in the stream of that water so I don't muddy it up any worse than it already is. And I'm going to go from the upstream side and put my bottle down there and fill it up. And put about half of it in the stream and half of it running over the side. Now, notice that I did not filter that water through anything. The reason for that is... If I'm going to filter this water, I'm going to use a proper filter, like some type of three-tiered filter that I can build if I have the time, to at least give me the comfort level of some of this stuff's being filtered out. If I just use my bandana, the only thing I'm really accomplishing is I'm filtering out any large particulates. I'd rather boil the water first, then pour it through a bandana into a cup to drink it, filtering out the large particulates then, because you're probably not going to get them all anyway when you're jacking around a stream trying to get this water bottle filled up. Okay, so now that I've got this filled up, I'm going to take this directly to the source of decontamination. I'm going to either put my chemicals in it right now, or I'm going to take it and I'm going to put it on the fire to boil. And that will kill anything on the outside of the bottle as well that might be contaminating the water. I'm not going to put the lid on the bottle and contaminate my threads until after this thing's been in the fire. If I'm using a chemical decontaminant, it's a different ball game. Then the only thing I can really do is put the lid on and hope. Okay, let's have a quick discussion about water filters and SteriPens for that matter. Because somebody will ask me about SteriPens and somebody will ask me about water filters like the MSR pump filters and things like catadines. My thought on those types of items is A, with the SteriPen, it may work 100%, it may work great. I don't trust anything that uses batteries. Sooner or later, then batteries are going to go bad. Depends on how long you're stuck out there. When it comes to filters, there is no filter on the market today that will kill 100% of all waterborne pathogens. Okay guys, one more final thought here real quick on this video. If I get myself into a situation where I have gotten lost, stranded, whatever the case may be, and I'm not properly prepared, drink the water. Don't let yourself be found dead from dehydration. It's better to be found sick. Most of the things like Cryptosporidium and Giardia are going to be short-lived in your system. They're gastrointestinal type infections. Five, six weeks, 
you're going to be okay with antibiotics. I'd rather be found alive and sick sitting by the water drinking and puking than dead laying beside a creek because I refuse to drink it. So my advice to you is take the proper precautions, pack your pack accordingly, check you know, with different people within the area you're going to operate in, the health department, things like that, and ask them what the chances are of contaminants in the water and what things you need to be prepared for and understand that before you go. Most of us are never going to be lost in the Amazon jungle where we have to worry about dengue fever and things like that. Most of us will be lost or stranded right here in the good old USA where the biggest things we have to worry about are cryptosporidium and giardia and some chemical contaminants possibly in the water. Make those calls, pack accordingly, stay safe. I'm Dave Canterbury with the Pathfinder School. I appreciate everything you do for me, for my school, for my family, my affiliate sponsors and friends. I'll be back with another video as soon as I can. Thanks, guys.